I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I'll be speaking with the chairman of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, former member of the European Parliament, about the situation in Ukraine. I think the first question to start off with is uh, a little bit of historical context. Uh, in the 1990s, um, we remember that there was a great deal of optimism and enthusiasm about um, the future of the continent of Europe. Uh, it was the end of the Cold War. There was the thought that uh, economic liberalism was going to become the wave of the future. Democracy and open societies were, were going to be proliferating throughout Middle, Central and Eastern Europe in particular. Um, today, we find ourselves uh, for the first time uh, for many, many years, perhaps since the Second World War, in a position where sovereign states in Europe are, are fighting against each other. Uh, how did we get from there to here, and was it avoidable? Well, I think it was avoidable, um, but I think now is not really the time for such an analysis. Um, I mean, clearly, a lot of mistakes were made, otherwise we wouldn't be in, in this position. Um, the, there have been huge successes in, in the post-war uh, evolution of, of Eastern Europe, um, but clearly the handling of Russia um, has, has not worked. Um, and that's the problem which we are wrestling with, with now. But um, the, the time to analyze precisely where we went wrong over the enlargement of the EU relative to the enlargement of NATO or the failure to encourage a, a democracy and a sound economy uh, that was not a, a kleptocratic state in, in Russia, um, that uh, will have to wait because the priority now obviously is to deal with the current crisis. Do you think that uh, what's happened over the past few weeks in, in Ukraine has, has changed fundamentally and permanently perhaps the security architecture of Europe? Well, I think the decision by Germany uh, at the weekend to totally transform its, its defense posture and to uh, recognize the need for European security um, is very, very significant. And I think that the path is now open for a truly integrated European military, perhaps a full European pillar within NATO um, that would be equal essentially in weight um, to that of the United States. I think that is now coming. Um, and that is a very significant move. Uh, I also think that the, the emotional reaction to this crisis across Europe has greatly strengthened the sense of a shared European identity. And, and the last time there was anything equivalent to this was actually the opposition to the Iraq war um, across Europe. And um, this is now a, a, a more robust um, expression, but it's the same thing. It is a sense of a shared European identity that transcends that of the interests of the individual states of the European Union. And that has been, in my view, very significant. I've been very struck by the way in which um, the domestic political debate about Russia in various European countries has been greatly affected by events of the past week. Um, France and Italy, uh, perhaps more interestingly in, in Poland and Hungary. What do you think the implications will be for the uh, supporters or at least the, the, the allies uh, of Putin in, in various European countries uh, and their parties and their contribution to, to um, political life in those countries? Well, it has, of course, been a fact that the anti-EU parties um, have almost all uh, been very favourable towards uh, Putin. And indeed, some may have received uh, support. Um, and the fact that they are now um, very much on the back foot, I think, is, is significant. This is clearly going to impact the French presidential elections. I think it's going to be quite significant in... Um, in Italy, um, uh, we'll see where the A AFD in Germany um, pays a price for having remained seated in the Bundestag debate um, uh, when the Ukrainian ambassador was welcomed. 
But I agree with you. I think the most important thing is um, where there's institutional disputes between the EU and member states. And this is obviously particularly true of Poland and of Hungary. We'll see whether uh, the elections in Hungary, uh, whether Orban is as much of a certainty to win those as, as was the thought before. There are people who think that he may now be in some trouble. And I find it very hard to believe that the um, Polish government's line on uh, its Supreme Court and the whole issue of the rule of law and judicial independence, uh, I think that is going to um, also be uh, transformed by this crisis. So mm -hmm. in that sense, this is very positive for um, not just the general unity of Europe, but for a reinforcement of European values. Do you think the Conservative Party will suffer domestically in this country from its previous association with uh, Russian money and Putin in particular? Oh, yes, indeed. I, I think that, that if these sanctions uh, have the uh, unravelling effect that uh, they should have on, the or, on, on Russian money um, in Britain and the role of, of the city and of the, the legal system in assisting um, their kleptocracy. Um, I think that will spill over into revealing the extent to which there was Russian support for Brexit. I also think that the, that the uh, saliency of immigration in the British debate is very significant in this. I mean, the reluctance with which Priti Patel has um, uh, shown towards welcoming Ukrainian refugees and the way in which that has had to be reversed is, I think, also of great significance. At the end of last week, people were still talking about uh, Germany dragging its feet on SWIFT and uh, uh, on other things. Um, why did the, the Volt farce occur so, so suddenly, do you think? Um, and was it significant that it was uh, uh, a, a social democratic chancellor sort of doing it? Well, I think that's true, because obviously the Social Democrats in, in Germany have been, um, I mean, uh, ever since long before the end of the Cold War, that the Ostpolitik has been a, the, the Social Democratic speciality. Uh, and they were more committed to a peaceful engagement with Russia in particular than, than um, any of the other political parties in, in Germany. Um, I think also what is significant and remains to be seen is whether the Greens will in Germany will now respond to the energy crisis that um, has clearly been created by uh, the Russian invasion uh, to alter their attitude towards nuclear power, to phasing out nuclear power. Um, if that were to come, then we would see really a very fundamental transformation of, of the German position. Why did it happen so suddenly though? Well, because I think that for a long time, people had assumed that the Russians would not go so far as this. I think everybody um, in the German establishment uh, had hoped that economic engagement with Russia um, would prevent this sort of development. Um, and obviously there were strong arguments in, in favor of such a position. Um, but the shock of Putin's actions, I think, was such that it, it led to this change. Um, and a new government coming in um, created the opportunity for that. Yes. Um, the German government have been very eager to put their greater military efforts, very much in the context of the EU, not just in the, in the context of, of NATO. Um, that, is, that is something of a uh, hangover, if you like, from, um, uh, from the past 80 years of, of, of German thinking. Um, but, but how easy will it be to get anything that could seriously be described as a, uh, a European army? Uh, economic sanctions are one thing, uh, putting people in harm's way um, as a result of a, a European decision 
is something different. Um, what do you see as being the steps that may lead to um, a greater military capacity that is plausible? Well, I think it's a lot easier now than it's been um, before for a technical reason, which is that all governments are very short of money because of the huge expenditure that's been um, done on uh, the COVID crisis. I mean, the, the irony of the, the European situation has always been that actually in terms of money that has been spent on defence or allocated defence, uh, the, the amount of spending is comparable to that of, of Russia, for example, um, on some measurements, significantly more. Um, but it has been spent in such an incompetent and uh, disjointed manner uh, that the actual war-making capacity that uh, such expenditures delivered has been uh, very modest. And so the if you are going to create a proper European defence, and there is now undoubtedly the political will for that, um, then integrating it um, deeply is the most cost-effective way of, of, of operating. But it may not be the most uh, attractive way of operating economically uh, for countries, for governments that want to be able to favour um, high-tech in particular um, sectors of their economy, do you think that will be? A, no, I think again, a, a um, can be overcome. what this is, what this is um, pushing, is a very significant integration of European defence industries. And if one looks at the way in which uh, the markets have reacted to uh, the German turnaround, uh, what is clearly emerging is um, a uh, significant investment, not just in in German companies that will benefit directly from. Uh, the boost that the federal government has given to defence spending, but uh, European defence um, industries overall. I think the problem um, for the UK in this is that now having left the European Union, we will be excluded from this process. And, and this is not particularly good news for European, def uh, for, for British defence um, businesses uh, in being able to benefit from what is going to be a very significant and integrative uh, boost to uh, European defence industries, and th all that will that expenditure will also uh, flow over into high tech, um, because obviously, um, I mean now is actually quite a good time to do a rearmament because we are on the cusp of a very significant technological change, the importance of um, cyber warfare and all the rest. I mean the fact that um, Putin is is having rather a retro war in the sense of um, putting a lot of tanks on the streets um, and a lot of artillery. Um, it's clear that actually quite a lot of this kit is taking a, a view of, of what real defence would be required if we're talking about a serious confrontation between uh, the West and uh, Russia or China. Um, that the new technologies in uh, cyber warfare, in drones and all the rest, um, is, is where the money should be spent. And, and so I would expect a boost to uh, EU um, high tech and um, uh, industries related to that, um, comparable to what has been a long established position in the United States at the strength of, of uh, tech in, in, in America has been driven very much by defense expenditure. Um, and I, I think we will see the same thing in Europe. You mentioned the possibility of the European Union becoming a, uh, a comparable pillar of NATO to the United States. Um, would the United States be prepared to accept that? Um, what would be the, the effect of that on the internal dynamics of, of NATO, which would be to transform NATO from into something very different to what it's been up till now? Well, this depends entirely on whether the American assessment that China is their chief enemy um, prevails, um, which I think it will, because it, it's been clear for some time that the Americans regard Asia Pacific as their principal security priority, because China is clearly a much more formidable opponent than Russia. And in fact, Russia's position is really very dependent on that of China. I would even go so far as to say I don't think Putin would have a dare to undertake the operation that is underway now in Ukraine without um, the support 
of China in a whole range of ways. Um, the modernization of the Russian army that has been taking place now for a decade or so has been very much dependent on the industrial base of China uh, because Russia does not have that industrial base. Um, and equally, uh, the Chinese capacity to uh, assist the Russians in circumventing the current financial uh, sanctions is very significant. Uh, I mean, in, in some respects, one, one could even go so far as to say that Putin is, to, to a degree, a Chinese pawn in this story. Um, and what will determine the outcome of this crisis is, I think, China's attitude towards it. Um, so the, if the Americans wish to concentrate more on, on Asia Pacific, then having a strong European defense, um, which relieves them of, 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 of burdens, which they can then reorientate towards Asia Pacific, is exactly in line with, with Washington's priorities. I'd like to talk about um, Brexit and its um, wider impact on the United Kingdom's contribution to European security. Um, but, but first, I'd make the observation and ask you to comment on it, uh, that Britain's self-allocated um, role of a supposed bridge between the United States and continental Europe uh, would become very difficult to sustain uh, if we did have uh, uh, a European pillar that was comp comparable to that of the United States. Uh, there wouldn't need to be a, an intermediary role for the United Kingdom. Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree completely. More generally, you talked about the way in which um, uh, Brexit made it difficult, would make it difficult for British firms to participate in, in the rearming of, of, of Europe. Um, are there any other geopolitical lessons that we've learned about Brexit from the past couple of months? Well, I think that the real story that um, has yet to emerge fully and which the, the current sanctions against Russia may expose is the degree to which uh, there was Russian support for Brexit itself and the extent to which Brexit was um, an early manoeuvre in dividing and weakening uh, the European Union um, ahead of the strategy that is now in plain sight on the streets of Kiev. Um, and that, I think, could be transformational in the British view, the British public's view of Brexit. Uh, that I think is 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 the political uh, significance of what is happening. Um, I mean, we're we're now in an extraordinary situation where you have Boris Johnson um, in Poland um, saying that he thinks that, um, or indicating that he thinks that the Ukraine joining the EU is rather a good thing. And people are going to be wondering why it is that we left the European Union, um, and we now have people in Ukraine fighting and dying in order to join it. Uh, this has not yet hit through into the debate in Britain, but I'm sure it will at some stage. That's the domestic aspect of it. Um, can we say from the events of the past um, three or four weeks um, that Britain's United Kingdom's position on the world stage has been affected negatively or positively by Brexit? Well, I certainly think that um, our semi-detachment from the European response um, has become evident. Um, I think that we will be uh, outside the, the main thrust of European rearmament. I think that um, the British um, position as a a broker between Europe and America ha has also been diminished. And then I think there is the issue of, of if we are in a, a new Cold War of some sort, if we are um, facing um, a, a new polarization, um, the idea of um, betting the ranch on global economic op opportunities, particularly in the Far East, particularly with China, which was mentioned in uh, in the Brexit debate. Um, I mean, all that is, is now um, up for grabs. Um, it, it's, it, and, and seems to be far less plausible 
um, if it was ever plausible in the first place. Um, and beyond that, I think you, you've got the specific impact of uh, the position of the City of London as a uh, place where, obviously, in particular at the moment, the focus is on, on Russian uh, use of London as a, as a, uh, a means of um, uh, evading of, um, and exploiting their um, kleptocratic activities in their own country. But this is also a feature in other, in other parts of the world. Um, and so in, in many respects, the model um, that predicated Brexit um, of a, a global, not a European Britain, one that was nimble and able to be outside uh, the uh, restrictions of EU membership in, in finance and in, in, in industry and in technology and things. I mean, all of that uh, seems to me um, even more incredible than it was when it was first proposed in 2016. How do you think things are going to develop over the next couple of weeks or even further than that? What, what's, what's the outcome of the specific situation in Ukraine going to be? Well, obviously, the danger is that Putin is in a very um, difficult position. Uh, it's, it, it's difficult to see how he can get out of where he is now. And the escalation uh, in the short run seems um, his only option. And the question is whether that will tip over into a full-blown confrontation with the West, um, which would obviously include a nuclear confrontation. So, I mean, that is the concern. I, I do feel that the Chinese element in this is potentially decisive. Um, the, the Chinese have obviously have wanted to detach uh, Europe from America because they want, um, they, they want a freer hand in, in Asia Pacific and had hoped to achieve that. I think that was partly why there has been ch significant Chinese support for for Putin. Um, also that Chinese interests in Central Asia have been part of that. But I don't believe that China is, has an interest in a full-blown confrontation with the West. I don't believe China is in favor of the economic consequences that are currently flowing from this crisis. And I think they are in the position to uh, call a halt on this for uh, the Russians. If, uh, the, if, if the Chinese put pressure on, on the Russians and, and are not prepared to provide a back door to evade the economic sanctions that have been imposed by the West, um, then I can't see uh, the, the Putin being able to sustain this operation uh, really for a matter of weeks, actually. Do you think that Putin can hold the Ukraine in the long term? Isn't he going to have to withdraw at some stage? What will be the terms and conditions of that withdrawal? Well, I think the this is the real issue for him now. Uh, if the escalation that he's undoubtedly undertaking uh, fails. Um, I can't see how he can remain in control of, uh, of Ukraine for any length of time. Ukraine is an enormous country. It's uh, 44 million people. Um, I think Putin believed his own propaganda that he would have a large number of people in Ukraine who wish to return to Mother Russia. Um, and that has clearly um, so far been comprehensively disproven. Um, there's no way in which he can, he can uh, continue to have control over a country that size with the resources that he has. Uh, the, the French in Algeria in, in, the, in 1960 had half a million men in a country which had then a population of only around 10 million. Um, there's no way in which Putin can hold down um, the Ukraine. His miscalculation seems to be very similar to that of Hitler in, in 1941, that all you needed to do was kick down the door and the whole rotten edifice would fall together. Um, Hitler turned out to be wrong. Um, same things happening to Putin on the, from the other side of the historical and national divide now. Indeed. Thank you very much. Um, there's been publicity given recently to a particular remark of Boris Johnson's during the... Um, referendum in 2016 
uh, in which he held up um, events in Ukraine uh, as being a, an example uh, of the ineptitude and incompetence of, of the European Union in its external relations. Uh, now, of course, he's very eager to work as closely as possible uh, with the European Union, with our friends in Europe. Um, it's a, a strange about, about face. What goes around comes around. Those who live longest will know most. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, I hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.